Welcome back to the Principal Podcast. Today's guest is Nishta Patel, the gut expert. Nishta, welcome. Thank you very much, Arjun. Really nice to be a guest here. Thank you. Awesome. I'm really, really looking forward to this conversation about gut health, um, learning your journey into the space. Sure. So uh, my journey started in 2010 uh, when on vacation to Alaska, my daughter, who was jet skiing at the time, her cousin turned the jet a little bit too fast. She fell in the water and swallowed some of that water. And I didn't think too much of it at the time. because She was all right afterwards. But about 10 days later, she started getting symptoms of um, IBD type symptoms, but I didn't know it was inflammatory bowel disease at the time, just multiple visits to the bathroom and um, just feeling generally unwell, stomach aches, things like that. And then um, we came back to the UK and things escalated, things got far worse. And then all of a sudden she was diagnosed with indeterminate Crohn's colitis. So uh, they weren't sure whether it was Crohn's, whether it was colitis. And for me, that was the most shocking part. Was that I, mean, I didn't have any knowledge in gut health at that time. I had no knowledge in nutrition or any of the stuff that I know now. Um, I just, it was a really scary time and I just needed to I, I listened to everything I was told to do, but the medication that was given to her was her symptoms were getting worse and the medication was improving and more medication was being given to counteract the side effects of the medication that was being given. So, for example, she was given some um, prednisolone, which is a steroid, which caused her to have more stomach aches and things. The doctor at the time had not looked, not told us anything about the fact that it should be enteric coated. Um, and because she was getting those issues, she was then given ibuprofen, which shouldn't have been given to her either, which was causing more stomach aches. Um, she was getting headaches and she was feeling sick. And as a result of being sick and nauseous and not being able to eat, she was being given Stematil. So it was drug after drug after drug and bones were aching, acne, like adrenal fatigue, you know, well, where the adrenals were not working as well as they should, a lot of malice, tiredness, uh, disturbances in sleep. Uh, joint pains and obviously the symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease, multiple visits to the bathroom, bleeding, all the rest of it were continuing. And I kept asking, is there a link between diet, lifestyle? Is there anything I can change? What should she be eating? I was told repeatedly, let her eat what she wants. Food has nothing to do with it. Diet has nothing to do with it and just keep taking medication we'll try this drug we'll try that drug so that was my first sort of um insight into it 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 just shocked me that you know we just couldn't get her better and it was worrying to the point when he said okay we've tried everything nothing's working let's now try biologics and let's see if um, that will make a difference and when I did the research I just thought no there's got to be another way and then I found a book by uh, the brilliant Jeannie Patel Thompson that was like my bible I read it from cover to cover I started implementing things in that book and she started improving and she started getting better and better and better to the point when her next colonoscopy was done, the doctor said to me, congratulations, um, everything is, it, you know, the medicine's working. It's quintessential that the colitis has calmed down. I can't see any signs of disease in the gut, at which point I said to him, I haven't given her any medication he was not very happy with me at that point. And uh, he, he did tell me that was a very dangerous thing to do. But I, I tried to say to him, well, look, medication wasn't working. I've tried 
alternate things. Maybe we can do some research. Maybe we can, you know, this affects so many young people. Why don't we look at some of the, the things I've implemented and see if we can do some clinical trials? And, and he said, not in this lifetime. And he walked away. He said, actually, he said to me, what you've done is like witchcraft. And if this child loses her colon, it is going to be down to you and I. This is really wrong. Um, and then I just thought to myself, well, look, the only thing I've changed is what I've learned from this book, supplements, diet, things like that. I'm going to go and study nutrition in more detail. So I signed myself up at the College of Naturopathic Medicine, London, and I did a three-year course in nutrition. And I then went on, I heard about functional medicine while I was doing that. So then I went on to coming to America to do my functional medicine training. Um, and as soon as I finished my nutrition training, I got a job with the London Clinic of Nutrition and um, saw lots and lots of patients. I've been helping patients since, so I know that there is a lot that can be done. And we know now because there's so much, you know, Instagram and things weren't out at that time. And now we've got so many more things available to us where we can, you know, listen to other people's experiences and and learn and research is growing all the time and functional medicine movement has moved quite a lot. So there's there's lots of things that can affect it. And you know, that was my journey into it and where I am today really. That's amazing because it's like of something that's very, very personal um to you and it impact I mean it impacted your daughter, which is precisely why you, you know, took it so seriously in the first place and now you found a, a very, very strong interest in that. So um, that's very admirable that you were willing to, you know, give something other than just the medicines that they kept prescribing um, a shot. Why do you think doctors were or are so hesitant to try things other than just prescribing medicine? And I guess taking a step back even, like what makes gut issues so difficult to uh, to trace down? I don't think it's, I think doctors do their best. I think they're brilliant at what they do. When you've got inflammation, things like that, you absolutely have to take the medicine. Uh, and they're doing what they know best and what they're trained at. They have, doctors get very little training in nutrition. You know, when they're, if you ask most of them how much training they've had in nutrition and lifestyle, it's happening now. Now there's a change again. But if you go right back in history um, to, to the very beginning, if you look at the very beginning, you look at where modern medicine, before modern medicine came along, you look at ancient medicine, you look at tra Chinese traditional medicine, you look at Ayurveda, you look at what the Greeks did. It was all simplistic diet, lifestyle, herbs, all those things that made up whether a person was well or sick. And then I think as modern medicine came along, we started losing that. And we started doing, I think the curriculum became less and less involved and less and less integrated. And it was all much more pharmaceutical, much more. Um, of course, everything has to be evidence and clinical based. We need that. You know, we need those um, things in place. But um, there is, I think there is a place for what our ancients taught us and what our grandmothers taught us. Just a great example of that is um, the introduction of oils like hydrogenated oils and how they affect our body, right? If you go back to Ayurvedic times, like my grandmother, I'm Indian, you're Indian. I, I bet your grandmother did the same. Like our grandparents ate ghee, which is like high in butyrate, high in butyric acid. They, it's really good for the gut lining. It's good for your mucosal membranes. But, you know, it was vilified that it's going to cause cholesterol. It's going to cause heart, heart disease. But yet we're using this hydrogenated fats and sunflower oils and canola oils and things that are, 
heated to a high degree that are causing more inflammation in the body and more. Why has heart disease, and diabetes and things suddenly, gut issues, all these things, why have they suddenly just spiralled? You know, if you correlate things, you look at how much sugar's in our diet these days, things like that. Doctors were never taught about those kind of things at mid school. Um, so I don't think it's down to them. I think that they, there are a lot of brilliant doctors out there who are, are starting to, the tide is turning, lifestyle medicine and intervention is now coming out more in the forefront. So um, from that point of view, I think the two can be integrated really well. You need both to you know, if somebody's got a really bad infection or something, of course they're going to need the antibiotics possibly, you know, to get them better. But, and then at the same time, you do need the probiotics too. So you've got the two schools working together, the two the two professions working together. You can integrate it into a much more holistic approach. It's really funny that you brought up like the things that our grandmothers, uh, you know, told us to eat. And like, I vividly remember <clears throat> my grandmother just like grabbing a spoonful of something and just forcing me to eat it. And I'm like, this is absolutely disgusting. Like, why are you doing this to me? Um, and it's funny looking back now because I've become so much more conscious and aware of things that are, are good for it and, and support a healthy gut. And I'm like, oh, wow, she actually kind of knew what she was talking about. Well, um, look at you, look at your spice box. Like, you know, when we look at our spice boxes, anybody that's Indian will know this, that you always have, like, these spices in your drawer. Uh, all Indian cooking has a basis of these spices. And you look at cinnamon. Cinnamon balances blood sugars. You look at cloves. Cloves are, like, antiparasitic. You look at turmeric. I mean, how many studies have been done on turmeric? It's been there for millennia in our culture right mm -hmm. got massive healing properties and anti-inflammatory properties we use black pepper we use the fats like ghee we use um cardamom and all those lovely herbs and spices that are that is our medicine cabinet that was our medicine cabinet way before modern medicine came along i mean when i've sprained my ankle before or cut my finger my grandmother's my mother even has just pulled out turmeric. You're like, what are you doing? You know, and this, <laughs> it, it, it with the turmeric and it's the clotting, it stopped the bleeding and, and it's it's healed pretty quickly or the sprain, you know, they will make up a paste, slap it on you, you walk around with a yellow foot for a few days, but the inflammation is down. No medicine, you know, and that can also cause an issue when you're taking too many drugs it's going to have an influence on your gut microbiome and what's going on with it or you know how many kids especially in the 80s and that and you're a bit younger you're a lot younger than me but out my generation antibiotics were dished out like candy right everybody was just given antibiotics and we know now the impact of antibiotics on the gut microbiome. And we know that, you know, a lot of doctors are much more cautious now. They will only give them when absolutely necessary, not with every sign of a sniffle and cold. It's your immune system, your gut has to be able to fight some of that naturally. Um, if, if the listeners have been listening to this conversation thus far, they might feel like, this topic of, of gut health is only for people who are having pain, who are going to see a doctor about their discomfort, things like that. It's obviously very important for everybody to be focusing on. And you mentioned a term just now, gut microbiome. And like, I, I can't quite define what that is. Could you, could you explain what a gut microbiome is? Oh, uh, sure. Inside your intestine, inside your body, you have um, a whole colony of viruses, bacteria, fungi that form your gut microbiome. And these, it's like a whole ecosystem that lives there. And it's actually almost as heavy as all the cells in your body. There's trillions of cells in the body and there's, there's different um, bacteria, viruses and fungi that live there and they all have different purposes. And some of them fight off viruses, uh, bad viruses or 
bad bacteria and things that come into the body, but they're there, you know, it's your immune system, you've got an immune system that communicates with them. And if there if there's dysbiosis where that you've got an imbalance of the good to the bad, that's when you can start diseases can start happening. So it's really important to look after that whole gut microbiome, the whole ecosystem that resides within us. Ooh. Right. We've got living, breathing organisms <laughs> organisms inside of us that need to be supported. Um, what what are some types of things that impact your gut microbiome? Obviously, your diet, um, even the air you breathe, I'm sure. Absolutely. Got a diet, um, lifestyle, sleep, huge one. People underrate and underestimate the importance of sleep. Mm -hmm. um, toxins in your environment, chemicals, cleaning agents, obviously smoking, drinking alcohol, sugar, all those kind of things can affect mold you're curious for my own benefit do pets impact your gut microbiome like would having a dog or a cat impact yeah your there's a stu there's many studies done on how they positively impact your gut microbiome positively positively having wow. pets and they it's like an interaction with their bacteria and your bacteria obviously if you're letting your animal lick you everywhere and stuff it, it can you can uh, transmit parasites and things like that but generally um you know being out in the dirt like that's another thing there's a whole uh, theory now of like the hygiene hypothesis where they're saying the gut of kids born these days is very different because like kids don't go outside and play anymore kids you know the mud and the dirt and pets bring all of that in so you mm. can put that up right from from mm -hmm. your pets but you know we pick things up everything's sterile everything's um using anti back spray that all affects your gut microbiome and back in the day when we were exposed to more bacteria and fungi and and things out in the environment and in the dirt we had more robust immune systems and more robust gut bacteria than we do now on pets also from a physical psychological point of view um have a great impact on um how we we do generally because the more anxious you are the more wired you are it can affect your gut whereas pets calm you down they bring that they, they have their own healing thing. They bring down your sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. And if you, if your nervous system is out of whack, you've got two arms to the, to the nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And one is your fight or flight and one is your rest and digest. And, you know, if we're stressed all the time right now, we've got so many stressors, you know, you set your alarm to an alarm clock, you know, you wake up to an alarm in the morning You've got EMF radiation going on through your cell phones and your wireless routers and things. And these are all things we didn't have if you're looking back at caveman days where you, you got up when the sun came up and you went to sleep when the sun went down and you maybe had a little bit of sugar in your diet from the odd berries and things you'd pick. And you'd go through longer periods of fasting, but you'd be out in the dirt, probably barefoot. And the biggest stress you'd have was if you were being chased by a bear or something where your adrenaline levels would go up because you're running away or you're so hungry, you need to kill that bear because your family needs to eat. So, you know, once you're out of that danger, that whole sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system would get back into balance. Nowadays, we just stress, stress, stress. You don't think about an alarm clock being a stressor, but it is because you're in a deep sleep, that alarm goes off. It wakes you up and then you might put it on snooze and you've got a lot of mini stresses. Then you might get caught in traffic. So you've got another mini stress and you've got a meeting and a deadline. And, you know, it goes on and on and on and on. And your body's in that state of being stressed quite a lot of the time. So that's also really important to, to balance your um sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system what are some things that we can do to alleviate stress and as it relates to to gut health specifically like is it just yoga meditation mindfulness that yeah all of those things yoga meditation mindfulness breathing is a big one a lot of us are shallow breathers 
doing some real deep breathing, doing some box breathing, cold showers, even mm. things that sound really wacky. There's evidence to suggest that we've got a nerve that connects from the brain to the gut called the vagal nerve. And when that's not toned enough, you can start having um, issues with with the um whole sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system and one of the ways in which to biohack that it's thought is by singing singing really loud so um and gagging is another thing which sounds so odd but it, it gets that um, <laughs> so when you when you're or gargling gargling is another one gargle and gargle and gargle until you um until you, your eyes are watering, you're almost thrown up, but that stimulates that that vagal nerve to, to get more toned. Um, so there's lots of things like that, but breathing is one that people often forget, like really doing deep breathing or box breathing, mm-hmm. where you breathe in for, say, five seconds or seven seconds, hold it for five or seven, and think of it as a box. So you go up and you breathe, and then <clears throat> you hold it, for five or seven seconds and then you um, breathe out hold it again you know so you're breathing in holding breathing out for the same amount of time and you're visualizing a box that can calm it down really nicely there's emotional freedom technique which you can you know i think there's youtube videos or you learn from somebody that can help you with that when you're tapping on your meridian lines your meditation um mindfulness all of those things it's amazing how such simple techniques can play such a can make such a big difference in not only your stress levels but also just how you feel day to day yeah and going to bed on time right right so so um just on that point specifically like having a consistent sleep schedule must be very important for regulating your gut and supporting a healthy gut right like if you're awake and 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 in bed at the same time every single day um does that play a big role in in the whole gut health a huge role because your body works on that circadian rhythm your body organs detox at certain times in the evening what time you eat your food what time you go to sleep the gap you've got between eating you know i always say also has an impact on your blood sugar levels which has an impact on everything else so you know, trying to eat your heavier meals at lunchtime, a lighter meal in the evening, and then leaving at least a minimum of three hours before you go to sleep. Three hours, wow. Minimum. I, I like wow. to do five uh-huh. if I can. So um, you say you had your last meal at six o'clock in the evening, seven, eight, nine, ten. You should not be going to bed at 11 o'clock anyway. You should be trying to get to bed by about nine. 30 10 o'clock mm-hmm. same time if i mean if you can it's impossible to go to bed for most of us on a circadian rhythm clock if you can do it brilliant especially in the summertime like you know or the winter time when the days are longer or shorter but you know, try and get eight hours of sleep hydrate your body well mm-hmm. um, do some form of mindfulness meditation journaling is another really good way as well um when you wake up in the morning have a morning routine even grounding which sounds really woo woo but just getting out onto some grass with your bare feet mm-hmm. watching the sunrise getting the sun to hit your eyes in the morning letting your brain know it's time to wake up in the morning and then at night having blackout curtains and giving your brain that clear signal it's time to go to sleep getting off your gadgets that's a big one we're all on our smartphones and our laptops and our television screens and things um so wearing blue blue light glasses can help with that trying not to go on your devices a couple of hours before you go to sleep so because when you do that the the eyes pick up the light and it signals the brain even though the brain is tired and it's time to go to sleep it's that light is signaling the brain that it's still daylight and you've got to stay awake because your brain's constantly fighting that fatigue and that has a massive role so the body is a creature that likes routine if it knows it's going to bed at a certain time it's waking up at a certain time it's getting um, fed correctly and hydrated and 
you're giving it all the tools it needs. It's a well-oiled engine. It will function well. So it's uh it's really funny that especially that last part that you just mentioned about like um past a certain time you don't want to be viewing artificial light because that sends the wrong signals to your brain and obviously interferes with your circadian clock like that's something that i've heard um on the andrew huberman's podcast huberman lab if you've heard it um and it's always tricky with these things right because i feel like you know you want on one hand you want all the information that you get in order to optimize your gut health but so for someone like me now, every time it's past like 1230 and I'm looking at my phone, even if it's to read, I'm like, oh man, I'm ruining my, I'm, I'm messing up my circadian clock, you know? So it's, it's tricky because you, you obviously want more information, the more information, the better, but at a certain point, like it becomes, um, you can become neurotic about it, you know? Um, and so I'd love to, whether it's now or later in the conversation, I'd love to unpack some strategies that everybody can implement to support a healthy gut, but maybe not go overboard right because like for a lot of people it might be easy to sleep and wake up at the same time every single day and they they might be able to do that but a lot of people who maybe work different shifts or um just have other things going on in their personal lives that you know gets in the way and, and serves as an obstacle to them doing that aren't able to do so yeah you you don't you don't necessarily, I mean, do as much as you can. Diet, we can all work on our diets, right? We can all reduce the amount of sugar we eat, mm -hmm. the amount of alcohol we drink, or the amount we smoke if we're smoking or, or try not to smoke. Um, mm -hmm. Incorporating different co colored fruits and vegetables in your diet. So include a rainbow of vegetables because they all have different properties different polyphenols and all the colors so where you're getting the purples in they're, they're good for brain health the reds are good for heart health and they're all good for gut health because they all have they all feed the microbiome they've got prebiotics and you know in them that then feed the bacteria which your probiotics, the good bacteria, which then have postbiotics where you get short chain fatty acids. It's the byproduct of what you're eating. So eating a rainbow, that is so easy. Everybody can eat a rainbow, you know, and that's people, what they say is to try and get 30 plant-based foods in your diet in a day. And people are like, what, how am I going to do that? But it is easy because plant-based is not just your fruits and vegetables. It's also your herbs and your spices. So if you're using pepper, you're using uh, oregano, oregano, as you guys call it, um, you you know, that's, that's counted as a plant-based food. If you're drinking herbal teas, you can switch your herbal teas around. So you could have peppermint in the morning and a green tea at like 11 o'clock and then a chamomile tea before bed. That's three different ones there. If you use some seeds um, and nuts, you know, making a salad, add in some black sesame seeds and some white sesame seeds. Use maybe um, different colored onions or different colored salad leaves and that every color counts as a different plant-based food so you can add it up pretty quickly or if you're making a meal and using lots of spices you you've done it you know i often do i can often do 15 20 in one go in one meal very easily so that's something you can do we can all remember to hydrate carry a water bottle with us clean filtered water do that daily get into a morning routine or a routine when you wake up to do something for you every day, like journaling or five minutes of nostril, alternate nostril breathing, or just open up your curtains in the morning and look out as soon as you wake up, get into a habit of doing that to just allow the brain to know or whenever you wake up. I know it's different when people are doing night shifts and things, um, but then on their days off, they can work things out and do things but it's, it's a lot harder for people that are on um shifts and i get that but just then making sure you're eating eat protein fats good fats like a little bit of avocado you know some kind of nuts and seeds and fiber with every single meal so you're keeping your blood sugars are not spiking you are not hangry a lot of people will get hangry um you know 
where you're hungry and angry because you're not eating because your blood sugars are dipping. You're going home. Oh, we've been there. Yeah. See? So, and, and just thinking out about what you're going to eat and just making more sensible choices of snacks, like not going to the gas station and picking up a packet of chips, or if you are going to do that, carry some nuts with you, get in the habit of just having a handful of nuts with you and an apple as you go. So you've got some fats, fiber, and, and, you know, some source of good nutrients going in, you're feeding the gut and, and that's going to go a long way, including if your gut's not too, you know, if you've got a really dysbiotic gut, then it's not always a good idea. But if you're relatively okay and you just want he- um, ways in which to improve it more is getting probiotic rich foods and even if you have got a bad gut you can do that eventually so you know um pro- yeah you've got your kombucha there um but kefir and homemade yogurts and sauerkraut kimchi having a little bit of probiotic foods every day those kind of things are going to improve your gut health Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to note that um, all of the foods that you just mentioned in that 30 are whole sources of food. Like you're not talking about beyond meat patties that are filled with like hydrogenated oils and soy and all that stuff. Like these are all whole foods and you just need to make an effort to grab those at the grocery store and just throw them in where you can. Right. So the, the overall point is do the best you can and just be mindful of your choices. And like you don't you don't need to go overboard. Also, don't eat in a hurry. How many of us eat our desco or how many of us are eating on the go and drinking on the go? All the time. All the time. So how long does it take to just take 10 or 15 minutes? To It makes a real big difference to digestion. When you are sitting down, you smell your food, you take that time to chew your food. And food, uh, you know, in the evenings, if you can eat with your family or eat with a loved one or, or a colleague or somebody that you genuinely like to spend time with, um, it's also good for, you know, whatever's going on mentally also affects your gut, right? But digestion actually starts from, from the brain and it works its way down. You see a food, you want to eat that food, you smell that food, you get hungry, your salivary glands are then producing amylase you know you chew the food the brain has to signal the esophagus to push that food down your stomach then has to do its thing to break the food down goes in it's a whole process when you're eating on the go you don't even get that signal that you're full so you can overeat you can pick up the wrong foods and not realize because you're just doing it without thinking if you're thinking about what you're eating what you're producing you know what you're putting into your body how it's healing or not healing your body because food whatever you put on the end of that fork can be the biggest form of medicine or the worst form of poison that's our choice right so when we're eating on the go and we're hurrying up your stomach if you're eating really fast you're eating on the go the hydrochloric acid in the stomach the stomach needs to produce more hydrochloric acid when you're stressed that becomes less and less and you end up with all kinds of issues like acid reflux and um indigestion things like that um often diarrhea lots lots and lots of different things because you haven't got enough enzymes being produced because the body's just not got time to do what it needs to do and it's trying to do its best just chewing your food properly and giving yourself time to smell it eat it chew it enjoy it can make a huge difference and that's like 10 minutes 15 minutes of your day Right. It's easy to feel like we're always strapped for time, but if you have time to, you know, sit down at your laptop and be intentional with your work, or you have time to be intentional with your exercise routine, like you should implement the same level of intentionality with your food, like sit down, eat your meal in peace and stop trying to do everything while on the go. That's a good reminder for myself. Um, I want to ask you about specific foods um, because of what we just discussed, but I also, uh, I I had another question about the morning routine thing. Um, you mentioned that you like to do five hours, you know, you don't eat five hours prior to bed, general rule of thumb, three hours. How long after waking should we wait to, to eat typically? So there's so much, there's so many different schools of thought on this. Some people do intermittent fasting and they do really well on it. Other people, 
try and do intermittent fasting and don't do so well on it. But um, I personally, I did try intermittent fasting for a long time and it was not good for my body. But everybody's individual, everybody's different. So usually I would wake up in the morning and have, I, I always go to bed with a with water by my bedside. First thing I do before I get up, before my feet even hit the ground, is drink a whole glass of water. And what that does, like a big glass, because what that does, it's at room temperature, it's not really cold. Um, it's hydrating my body. The body organs have been working overnight doing their things. So you're putting hydration back into your body before you've even had to worry about how much water you're going to be drinking. Then I might go off and do some breathing or some meditation or journaling, whatever it is I'm doing for that morning routine. Um and then I, I, it'll be about within two hours of me waking personally that I will break my fast and I will try and do it with something like some fruit. If I'm doing fruit, I will always do that on an empty stomach um, and then wait for a little while before I put anything else into my body. Oil. And then I will get some protein in it you know or I might do a little bit of fruit with some nuts something like that or it will be protein for me um always like eggs and spinach and tomatoes something like that or if you're doing porridge I would add in some maybe um a small a couple of teaspoons or a tablespoon of a nut butter like almond butter maybe some a small thing of chia seeds a handful of blueberries so that I'm getting that fat fiber and protein in into that breakfast uh, as a start of the day but you start the day right I do believe that you need to fuel the body and start the day right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you said within two hours not it's not like you're just reaching by your bedside and you're grabbing that cup of coffee or you're grabbing like a protein bar like so many of us do and don't start your day with a stimulant like coffee and things do that mm -hmm. a little bit later on yep so let me let me ask you about specific foods in general we just talked about coffee for two seconds coffee does coffee can coffee inflame your gut to any to any degree so there is new research out right now which actually states that coffee can be good for the gut bi microbiome. Mm -hmm. uh, there are different types of coffee. Obviously, there's different grades. So instant coffee would not be great. But if you get a good quality coffee, a coffee can be quite moldy too. So a lot of people with gut issues can be quite uh, sensitive to moldy things, moldy foods. So you need a good quality coffee ground coffee is better if you're somebody that has genetically we've got a gene that can uh, you can either process coffee well or you don't and drinking it after a certain time can affect your sleep uh, I have seen something or read something um, don't quote me on it but there is some research out that we all get affected by it whether we sleep or not even if you drink it you know some people drink it later at night and they sleep it still affects their blood sugars and they wake up at a certain time so with coffee I'd say go for a good quality coffee try and drink it before two o'clock if you're especially if you're somebody that really suffers from sleep issues um, <clears throat> and have that, enjoy your cup of coffee, but don't go for lots and lots because it can be acidic and it can sometimes affect people. I, I know with a lot of my inflammatory bowel disease patients, it can, I have seen it have an impact on them if with the Crohn's and colitis. Other people, I mean, it's, everybody's different, but the research out there is saying it actually has a little bit of fiber in it too, and it can be good for the gut microbiome for those that can tolerate it and have the genes that can process it properly understood yeah it's an important note that you mentioned that everybody is different so you need to really take the time to understand what works for you but i think that's generally positive news for all the coffee enthusiasts out there that coffee could be supporting a healthy gut in moderation um, in moderation that's right um i've i've since weaned off the um instant coffee 
also a lot of people that have gut issues are sensitive to gluten and a lot of people don't know that instant coffee has got binders in it and sometimes some of those some brands those binders do contain gluten so even if you're gluten-free and you're drinking the instant coffee you might be especially if you're super sensitive to it inadvertently taking gluten in and not even knowing that you're taking it in through the coffee the more you know (laughs) another um another food or i guess another item that i wanted to ask about something that i grab at the grocery store probably three to five times a week is like these uh, packaged protein shakes. And I've noticed that these are flavored with stevia, not sugar, right? Which everybody's got a different opinion on that. But could you provide your perspective on how that might be impacting my gut microbiome? Well, again, with stevia, there is, I'm not the expert on stevia, but I know that I have read something where some stevia is more synthetic than other stevia because you get purer forms Mm -hmm. and then I know some doctors in the alternate um, medical field do use stevia uh, for for certain issues that people have with their gut or it's like it can be an antimicrobial or an anti- um, uh, I think they use it for Lyme, uh, for certain things to treat Lyme, things like that. So stevia, I think if it's a good form of stevia and it's naturally derived and it's not super processed, it, it can be fine. In, in, in Again, you don't need much of it because it's like 10 times sweeter than sugar. It does have a slight aftertaste to it, but I think out of all the sweeteners, it's the one that they say is a better one. It's the whey protein that sometimes causes a lot of gut issues for people. But then there are other forms. But then there's a whole, you know, there's so many schools of thought on sweeteners and there's so many fors and against. And it's there's research for, research against. Um, You know, personally, I don't touch sweeteners. This is my personal view. I don't like mm-hmm. aspartame. I don't like saccharin. Uh, I know there's there's some people that advocate it, and there is there is some evidence out there that's you know saying it's inconclusive. But I don't like anything lab made. When I can have, I will always go for whole foods and natural. Um, I don't add sugars to my drinks mm-hmm. or my food generally, but. If I had to, I would go for the most natural form I could. And again, make sure you've got the fat and the fiber to stop that blood sugar spiking so much. But I'd go for a good quality honey, like that's local, or 100% maple syrup or something like that if I needed to. But sugar is sugar is sugar, so it is going to affect you. Yeah. One way or another, it will spike your blood sugars. So that's important to know too. Yeah, I think um, it's difficult because so many times a lot of these studies are inconclusive and there's experts on either side, right? Like even if you're talking about dieting, there's people who believe that a pure vegetarian diet is is fantastic. And then there's people who believe a pure carnivore diet is fantastic, right? So I think um, like the point that you just made is more so just if you can stick to whole natural foods and then just for those, you know, those once in a while occurrences where you need to have the processed food, like you're probably fine. Um, but that's just a good general rule of thumb. Yeah. I and mean, that's, that's how I generally go. Cause there's going to be instances <clears throat> where you can't avoid things, right? Yeah. Sometimes you can't be Puritan about things, but I do the 80, 20 rule, 80% of the time, especially when you're at home, you can control what you're eating, doing, and the other 20% of the time you try and make the wisest choices that you can, but sometimes it's going to be inevitable. There are going to be things that you can't, you can't, unless you're really, really, really sick, like a lot of people are, just, just the general average person that can go about their business doing that. If you want to be healthy, that's probably a good way of thinking and sort of applying rules to try Mm -hmm. and get yourself into better health. Yep. I assume the same applies for, you mentioned probiotics. 
I assume the same applies for probiotics. You would prefer that your clients get their probiotics from naturally occurring sources, kombucha, kefir, kefir, whatever it's called, um, yogurts, as opposed to taking probiotic pills. Yeah. I mean, again, it's case by case. Some people cannot do too much kombucha because there's like uh, problems with the fungi, yeasty things in there. Some people can't do yogurt because uh, like dairy yogurt, because they've got an issue with with dairy, <laughs> but you can do coconut yogurt or something like that. Um, sauerkraut things. And if you are somebody that's not sure, or you're somebody that really suffers a lot then what I would do is um I would maybe just start off with a teaspoon of sauerkraut juice just a teaspoon you know um don't go in and just go for it all in one go go for a teaspoon of the juice see how your gut goes with that get used to that over a few days and then increase that gradually to a tablespoon of just the juice if you're okay with that you're not getting a lot of fluctuance and and wind and uneasiness and whatever, then you can go to a teaspoon of actually eating the the sauerkraut, chewing it really well, seeing how it sits with you and working your way up. That's always the most sensible. Do everything in moderation. Don't go crazy because too much of anything can also be bad, right? So everything in moderation. Absolutely. The point being, don't go overboard once again. Um, let's talk about the 20% of the time where you can't control, right? Like if you are in a social situation where you might feel like you have an obligation to, to consume alcohol, are there certain types of alcohol that are less, um, impactful to your gut health? Yeah. Beer, beer is often, there's, there's some alcohols like beer that have hot, and gluten and things in them that can make you bloat more and get you more give you more gut issues if you're prone to like gluten sensitivity or hop sensitivity the if often alcohol affects the gut then that affects the mood most alcohol affects your mood anyway you go on a high and come down <laughs> one alcohol that they say is the happy alcohol. It's the one that doesn't affect the serotonin receptors and things is tequila, which is it is quite strong though, you know. Um, certain other al- spirits are really strong and they can affect your liver, but generally they are a little bit easier on the gut. Again in moderation but everybody's different it could you know you might be perfectly fine with beer and I'll just have two sips and it will just completely wipe me out everybody's you know genetic makeup everybody's very very different but as a general rule of thumb beer is the one that bloats a lot of people out and causes more issues you can then try a gluten-free beer see if that that makes a difference or anything fizzy can often you know anything with a lot of fizz in it maybe champagne prosecco things like that can also make you more gassy and bloaty whereas sometimes the cleaner spirits like a gin um or or a tequila may not be as bad for some people i'll stick to my tequilas then (laughs) um obviously certain foods are going to impact different people differently but if we could paint like a, a broad brush for a second here are there any vegetables that or i guess vegetarian foods in general that are detrimental to gut health for a lot of people um are there are there certain foods that maybe a lot of people find problems with yeah lectins can a lot of people with gut issues have a sensitivity to lectins and these are found in beans and pulses and one way around this is like maybe try and buy your pulses and beans dry soak them rinse them really well that takes off some of it and then soak them um, so if I was making some kind, say chickpeas, for example, if I was doing a chickpea curry or something, I would soak my uh, chick. I'd rinse them really well, soak them in the morning, and keep rinsing them. If I went into the kitchen to do something, I'd rinse them again, re-soak them, 
and do that for at least 24 hours and then I would pressure cook them so that will help to take out some of those lectins and um because beans and pulses and lectins uh, beans and pulses are covered with um a layer that is protected it's their protective mechanism from birds and things getting to them and that can often cause issues with people with sensitive guts so that's one type of food that that could cause an issue sometimes for vegetarians dairy proteins are an issue for many people with their guts um sometimes it can be really healthy food sulfuric vegetables which are generally super good for you but too much cabbage or broccoli or cauliflower can cause an issue for some people too but generally it's the pulses and lectins that can dulls things like that can be a real issue Absolutely. Like from firsthand experience, the chickpea thing, like I always try to get all those little bubbles out. And so now I know those are called lectins. Yeah. And then if you buy tins, I mean, tins are also full of like other things, but if you've got, you know, if you're going to get a tin, rinse it really well. Like I would put boiling water in there, rinse it, get rid of the preservatives and chemicals that they've put in there and Mm -hmm. try and rinse them really, really well. I'd put it in hot water first and then run that through cold until you think a lot of that's out that can sometimes help too got it that's a very good tip like just buy the beans dry and you know do the whole process yourself for 24 hours rather than getting the the canned um and pressure cook it if you can or slow cook it in a slow cooker Mm -hmm. i'm not a big fan of instapots i'm not a fan of cooking things really quickly yeah nutritionally and otherwise i don't think it's great i think it's actually quite horrendous i've seen people just like get chick dry chickpeas and cook them in in 20 minutes i would never advocate that is there any research to suggest that maybe enzyme supplementation is something that more people should explore um as part of their daily diet I think if your body requires it or you need a helping hand, enzymes Mm -hmm. can be brilliant. Sometimes people are low naturally in enzymes. But again, if you are processing, assimilating, digesting things the way you need to, I would never encourage you to go off and get synthetic help if you don't need it. Just taking that time out, like we talked about, chewing your food, being more present, being more mindful can make a world of difference. Sometimes that's all it takes. Yeah. Other times you might need some, um, I often say, okay, do a little bit of apple cider vinegar in some water, drink it with a straw mm-hmm. to make sure your teeth are not, you know, the enamel's not destroyed. And sometimes that's all that's needed just to give you that little bit of a boost. But if the foods are cooked in the right way, if you're somebody that suffers from a lot of digestive issues, generally cook your food um and or pressure cook it or slow cook it and you will find that you can digest it a lot better than if you were eating salads because there's insoluble fiber in that salad that your your body doesn't recognize that insoluble fiber and it doesn't break it down properly and it can pass through you Mm -hmm. and cause issues even though salads are great because you've got to have the enzymes to be able to digest and process those so if you cook the foods it's easier for your digestive system to to um, pass them through we want to make sure that you're trying all of the um this the simple fixes and the natural remedies before you go on and, and start adding things to your diet that you might not necessarily need yeah. Right. Because then you develop a reliance on something that you, you could probably go without. Absolutely. Great. Um, thank you for that. That was very helpful um, going through all of those. Those are things that I've had questions about for a long time. So I, I definitely appreciate you, um, you know, sharing some insight on each of those. We kind of started our conversation with the story of your daughter and how she, while on vacation, swallowed some ocean water and that spiraled into, um, you know, her developing some gut issues. For a lot of people, like myself included, I can't really trace back, like I developed lactose intolerance um, at 16 and like it just came out of, out of nowhere. Like I used to drink milk like every day and then one day I just couldn't, you know, um, and I can't really point to a specific time that my, my gut microbiome um, changed, um, a specific event. 
And a lot of people develop issues randomly, you know, that might happen from an introduction of a new variety of bacteria or whatever the case may be. Um, are there ways that these changes in our in our guts can be traced back? And is this normal for pe- for for a lot of people? Like, is this a normal occurrence for for people to have? So lots and lots of factors make up what's going on with you either now or later on in functional medicine we look at things from like what was your mother's health like when she was pregnant with you was she quite stressed what was her microbiome like Uh, were you naturally born were you c-section born and you think why are you asking that because like I didn't develop something until I was 16 but your whole gut microbiome starts to develop way before you were born right and and your mother's health will have something to do with that when you're c-section born uh, born it's very different when you're being naturally born you're being pushed out of the birth canal you're picking up bacteria from mum and that colonizes it's very different to a c-section baby and then maybe you've had like a whole load of antibiotics or some other kind of medicine or you've had throat infections and, and ear infections that can mess up your microbiome and so and the way I like to look at it is you've got a glass that you know each of us are born with a glass that's kind of half full so we will have some toxins we will have some things that are going to influence what's going on with us but then maybe you're living in an environment where there's a lot of arguments there's a lot of stress so you're worrying about you know your parents fighting or whatever this is just a off the cuff example so that's building more stress up it's getting you you know your your whole system is getting a little bit more worked up and uh or you're at school you really hate going to school you're being bullied or something like that so the anxiety levels are building up or you're eating a really bad diet you know maybe your mom's feeding you really well at home but you're going to school and you're eating a load of crap at school and you're buying like you're drinking lots of soda and things like that, all those little things, they add up, add up, add up, add up until that glass starts to overflow. You all, we, you know, people are like, oh, but I got an autoimmune disease straight away. Like it came out of the blue. They never come straight out of the blue. It all works its way up. So it's little influences like this bit by bit by bit will then cause, you know, you start off losing, um, you'll be intolerant to foods then you've got chemical in sensitivities where you might be more sensitive to smells and things like that and then you get the autoimmune disease it doesn't just happen so you probably and a lot of us are born without um that enzyme to uh for lactose we, we're, we're lactose intolerant especially south asians um but we're kind of trying to adapt in our new environments and whatever and you know it then starts to develop bit by bit by bit until you get to a tipping point where you can't do it anymore so it was probably working its way up I don't know if you were on antibiotics when you're a kid if you did get lots of throat and ear infections what your diet was like what your stress levels were like whether your mother breastfed you whether you were bottle fed all those how long were you breast and bottle fed for what age were you weaned what were you weaned on and it's good it, you know when you are from a certain ethnicity too and you move away from your roots and your environment and your your climate all of those things your vitamin d levels are different your, your exposure to the outdoors all of those things they influence what's going on with you today and they can play a part in what's going on that's so fascinating because like i as somebody who loves ice cream i wish there was something that i could chalk it up to and find a way to reverse my lactose intolerance but like it's so fascinating how like the way you were born the antibiotics you were on um the kind of like climate you were exposed to what your background is all of these things make up what foods you can tolerate it's it's so fascinating um and to hear that level of detail is really really helpful in in my understanding and i'm sure a lot of people's understanding in um some of the issues that they face with their gut yeah it's it's 
crazy how many things can influence not just your gut but your overall you know wellness or disease earlier on in the conversation you mentioned um dr Ginny patel thompson's book she's not a doctor she but she's Ginny patel thompson was a lady that developed crohn's disease in her i think she's about 19 years old her father is a doctor i think her brother's a pharmacist she went down the conventional route it scared her to death when um they said that you know what you're always going to have this you're gonna but we'll just cut bits out and then she started researching and she was like what they're going to cut one piece out and I could develop this disease in three other areas am I going to be having surgery for the rest of my life and they said to her and don't worry you'll never be able to have children but don't worry because you'll be on disability and she then started doing a lot of research and, and she's done a lot of great work you know, trying to develop protocols and ways in which she can help. She's helped thousands and thousands of re- readers and she's a big advocate of getting things to where they need to be for, for people with IBD. Mm-hmm. That's an amazing story of just resourcefulness and her figuring yeah. it out and realizing that that's not the path that she wants to go down and uh, being really uh, resolute and, and figuring out another solution for herself. Yeah, she's a lovely, lovely lady too. Are there any resources that you would recommend that people um, more interested in, in exploring um, this topic uh, pick up? For, for Crohn's colitis itself or gut, gut issues, her, her book, Listen to Your Gut, is really good. It's a really good place to start. She also has some other ones like Listen to Your IBS. There's a, In England, we have a professor called Dr. Tim, Professor Tim Spector, he's done a whole microbiome project. He's at King's College London, Mm -hmm. so you could Google him. And he's got a new thing out called Zoe. It's an app where, um, and it's it's from the research and the data they've collated from thousands of people. They're going to be putting something together, which looks at your gut bacteria and what you can be eating or what you should be eating, how it affects your blood sugar levels. So, this, this field is ever growing. Um, so those are good places to, to start. Awesome. I'll absolutely link to those in the, in the show notes. Um, and I think, I think it's a great thing that this field is growing because obviously gut issues are becoming more and more prevalent, the more processed foods that we introduce into our, into our bodies. Um, so it's, it's good that people are having this conversation and I'm sure a lot of people will enjoy this conversation for that. So thank you again for your time. That's okay. You're welcome. On a last note, my daughter has got, because she's been suffering from this and she wanted to help other people, her Instagram page is the note cook underscore. The she's, note cook? Yeah. With an underscore at the end. And I'm the gut expert with an underscore at the end, but her page has got lots of lovely recipes on there and people that are lactose intolerant or I mean she does use a little bit of butter and ghee from time to time but most of her recipes are gluten and dairy free too so there's lots of lovely things on there that you can pick up that's amazing I can't wait to check it out and I'll I'll be sure to link to that as well in the show notes thank you for um thank you for sharing that where can people find you online so I have my website is thegutexpert.com and mm-hmm. they can just send me a message through there or I'm on Instagram under the gut expert underscore. And I also have a Facebook group called Nish- the gut expert dash Nishta Patel. Um, so you can join my Facebook group too. I'm trying to keep up with all this social media and trying to get posts out there that are helpful for people Mm -hmm. but trying to do it alongside running clinics is sometimes difficult because I like to write my own content and do my own things like which I think is very very important yeah Um, so I'm not posting as regularly as I'd like to but I'm working on trying to do that and developing some online courses and programs that's all in the pipeline as and when I get the time to do it Yep. Never enough time, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you've been a wealth of knowledge today and I've learned a ton and I know the audience is going to take away a ton um, from this conversation. So sincerely, thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me.